and so on. You can sort of see the characteristics there, but it's also given on this next slide. Uh, there's any time we switch from Mac to PC, it, it always does this to me. Uh, the IBM Power 7 should be across from the AND Opteron over on the far right uh, image uh, itself. This is comparing Jaguar, which is the current number one on the top 500 list. So Jaguar is currently the fastest computer in the world. Uh, has a peak performance of 2.3 petaflops. You can see comparing it to Blue Waters, Blue Waters is going to have about 10 petaflops of peak performance. Uh, there are 225,000, just a little less than 225,000 cores in Jaguar. There's actually just a little more than 300,000 cores in Blue Waters. So you can see that each of the cores is a lot more powerful in Blue Waters. We're getting a factor of four increase in performance with only about a 50% increase uh, in the number of cores. Again, the, everything is misaligned here because of that one uh, glitch that we always have. Uh, there's about 300 terabytes of memory on uh, Jaguar. There's 1,200 terabytes of memory, so 1.2 petabytes of memory on Blue Waters. Uh, Jaguar has five petabytes of online disk storage. Uh, Blue Waters will have greater than 18 uh, petabytes. Sustained disk transfer rate between the, the memory and the disk uh, is 0.24 terabytes per second. On Jaguar, it's going to be greater than one and a half terabytes per second on Blue Waters. So a significant increase uh, in that kind of capability. And you can't see it down at the bottom here, but there's 20 petabytes of archival tape storage on Jaguar. There'll be up to 500 petabytes of tape storage on Blue Waters. So that's a half an exabyte. That's probably the first time you'll really hear about exabyte in, in real terms. So that's a half an exabyte. And we can actually, if we had to, we can increase that to a full exabyte of storage. Here are just some of the critical features. I'll let you uh, look uh, over that uh, in your leisure, but just some of what we consider to be the critical features of Blue Waters, the high performance compute node, the high performance interconnect, the high performance IO and data archive systems, and then some general kinds of things like hardware support for global shared memory, which is another feature that we have on Blue Waters, which makes it uh, very unusual. But again, that's probably something that we're going to see on many future uh, computing systems. We actually had to build a new uh, computing facility to house Blue Waters. Uh, this is the National Petascale Computing Facility. It's about a 90,000 square foot uh, building itself, 30,000 square feet of raised floor. There's one 20,000 square foot gallery, which is just entirely open, that you can put machines, archives, et cetera, uh, in. Uh, we're confident that it'll be LEED certified gold. LEED certification tells you uh, the energy efficiency of the building. Uh, we actually have a goal of platinum. We don't know whether we can meet platinum or not, but we're very close. We're well over the number of points we need for gold. We're not quite yet to the number of points uh, that we need for platinum. Even more important is something called the power utilization efficiency. That's basically the power coming into the building divided by the power required to run the computers. So this tells you basically how much power you're wasting in running the rest of the building. Typically that number is between 1.6 and 2. That is you could be wasting as much energy as being used to run the computers in the facility itself. Uh, the National Petascale Computing Facility will have a PUE between 1.1 and 1.2. So it'll be something less than 20% uh, of the energy will be used to run the building. Almost everything is being run, used to run the computers themselves. Let me finish off then by talking a little bit about uh, the path to exascale computing. And maybe just one sobering thought uh, here to begin with. Uh, Blue Waters is really great technology. I hope that, that I convinced you that in fact it is probably going to really be the most powerful computer in the world for doing science and engineering. 
but we can push the technology in blue waters up to about 15 petaflops, and that's it. So we can't get the 20 petaflops with blue waters. If you get, want to get the 20 petaflops, you have to change the technology. And in fact, our colleagues out at Lawrence Livermore uh, are doing that with a system that they call Sequoia. Sequoia is built not on the IBM Perks system or Power 7 system, but on the Blue Gene Q technology. Peak performance will be around 20 petaflops for that particular system. Uh, we actually suspect that we may beat them on sustained performance on many, many applications. That it is, they may have a peak performance that's greater than ours by a factor of two, but when it comes to delivering performance to applications, we figure we're going to be very competitive uh, with them. But look at some of the other changes. Number of cores, not eight, now it's 16. To get the 20 petaflops, they don't need 300,000 cores, they need 1.6 million cores to be able to achieve that. So your application, if you're going to achieve 20 petaflops, your application has to scale to 1.6 million cores, not the 300,000 cores. Um, amount of memory is only slightly larger than what it is that uh, we have in Blue Waters, despite the fact that it's a factor of two uh, faster. Um, sustained uh, this transfer rate, you see, they're much less than the 1.5 that we're predicting with Blue Water. So this is the hint of what's to come. You're going to be dealing with lots more cores than what you have in Blue Waters. Blue Waters is kind of a nice way station, but it's not what the future is going to be. The future is going to be many, many more cores than what Blue Waters have. So we're, Blue Waters gives us an, a, a bit of breathing room, but we don't want to get too confident. Uh, that uh, about it all. So what are we going to see? What's this path to, from petascale to exascale look like? Well again, the number of cores. We're going to go from hundreds of thousands of cores on blue waters to if we're going to the exascale, we're talking about hundreds of millions of cores. So it's not just the 1.6 million that is in Sequoia, but if we're going to really achieve a petaflop, we're talking about hundreds of millions. Uh, of course. The number of threads that we have on Blue Waters, since we have about 300,000 cores and each of them can support four threads, it means we've got about a million threads. Well, we're going to have to have about a billion threads if we're going to really achieve the exascale. We're going to have to do this with no significant increase in the clock rate, because right now we do not know how to solve the current leakage problem. That doesn't mean that Intel and IBM and others aren't working on that problem. They're trying to develop new materials that will reduce the amount of current leakage, but they have no known solution uh, at this point. Amount of memory per core. If you set and, and calculated it, you realize that there are four gigabytes of memory per core uh, on Blue Waters. That's probably going to go from four gigabytes of memory to maybe a few hundred megabytes of memory per core on an exascale machine. We're going to have to be really aggressive about fault management. Even in Blue Waters, Blue Waters has over 40,000 disk drives on it. We went with really sturdy disk drives. We think we'll lose a disk drive every day. If we'd gone down to Best Buy and bought the disk drives that they had down there, we would lose a dozen disk drives every day. So we went to industrial grade disk drives, but we're still going to lose one of them every day. We're going to be losing cores and chips every day. The machine's going to be constant, something's constantly going to be failing on the machine. Now think about taking that and scaling it up to an exascale machine. Things are really going to be failing all the time. It's not just going to be one per day. It's going to be many, many things are going to be failing uh, every day. So you're going to have to write software actually that protects against that. There, I don't think the people who write the operating system software and the design the hardware will be able to mask all of that from you. So you're going to have to think a lot more about how it is you do fault uh, management. And then power consumption. That's going to be the real bugaboo. Because right now it's sort of in the range of 10 megawatts for something like Blue Waters. When we get to an exascale, 
Even the most conservative estimates say it's going to at least be 40 megawatts. And I've seen numbers actually up much higher than 150 megawatts uh, that are indicated there. So they're actually going to start thinking about how many flops do you get for, per picojoule, not how many flops you get per cycle, but it's going to be an energy weighted um, criteria. So what are the take home lessons for all of this? Uh, well, one is we clearly need to examine new computing technologies. Computers of the future will be based on these many core chips. There's just no way we can get around it. We can't get by with putting tens of cores on a chip. We're going to have to put hundreds and thousands of cores on a chip if we're really going to, to move beyond what it is that we can do with blue waters. Uh, the details, we still don't know. Uh, and they may even be heterogeneous, like the AMD example uh, that I gave you. We need to focus on scalable algorithms because the only significant gains we're going to see in performance in the future will become through increased use of parallelization. So what you'll be learning in this course is really critical, not only for using the machines that are available now, but actually in using the machines that will be there in the future. Uh, we do need to explore new programming models. Uh, you're going to be learning about MPI if you don't know it already. My guess is that all of you do know about MPI. I have computer science colleagues that say MPI, certainly as it is presently constituted, will not be the means of communication between the processors when we get to the exascale. It's sort of hanging there together on blue waters, but if you get well beyond blue waters, uh, it's just not going to work. So we need to really start looking at new ways of programming them. And actually, that could have a benefit, because if we do develop some new ways of programming them, it might be actually easier than using MPI uh, itself. And then we have to worry about this reliability uh, problems. There are th some things that we can do at the systems level, for example, virtualization. Uh, I don't know if you'll be learning about it, but uh, there is something called adaptive MPI. Right now, if, an, if, if, if a core crashes while two processors are communicating, the, that will bring down the entire application. Whereas adaptive MPI would actually pick that up and transfer it to a new set of cores to continue with the calculation itself. And so these are all some of the take home lessons uh, that you will have. And then finally, I certainly uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope, it's, hope this glimpse at what the future of computing looks like uh, is, is interesting. I think it certainly reinforces the importance of the course uh, that you're taking now. And as I said, if you're interested in learning how to program the mini core uh, processors, there is also a virtual school course on exactly that topic. But thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. We have uh, time for questions. So we'll go around uh, to some of the sites and ask if there are any particular questions. And let me start with uh, LSU. Any questions from LSU? All right, how about Clemson? Any questions from Clemson? <laughs> 